what is going on anyway? This time on the podcast, we get the hexagram danger. It always gives me a little fright when I receive that one. But don't worry, let's talk about it. And I'll do my best to make sense of it as we approach this new sturgeon moon time. The tambora is not tuned. It's been rainy and wet, and the humidity is hovering around 80%. goes up when the downpours happen. It's July in Maine, and it's been rainy. We have not seen much sun. Hello and welcome. I'm Anne Headley, and this is my podcast, What is Going On Anyway? Join me as I ponder over this new moon time and share my thoughts with you. July in America is a time that public schools, most schools, our pattern is that we have summers off. The kids have summers off. And that means that we often plan our family reunions and time with loved ones together in this summertime. And when we get together with our family and our friends, sometimes questions come up of familiarity, nostalgia. Where did I come from? Ooh, I remember that smells become important and memories surface. We tell stories with and about each other. My sister and my mother were here visiting recently and we had a really great time. I thought about how I was raised and who raised me and familiar patterns and familial patterns and familiar patterns and conditioning lots of things. Why do I think this? Why is my reaction to a situation almost identical to my sister's reaction? And then along comes my mom and she has an identical reaction. And then who is thinking these thoughts and where do they come from? And is anything even original to me? So lots of questions came up for me around my identity and how just by that connection of having the same genetics and conditioning, it creates quite a lot of similar patternings and responses. So I started to consider how I was raised by so many other things besides just my parents and the society that I was in. And I want to share that with you. I was raised by water. Born on the Virginia Peninsula, surrounded by the James and York Rivers, who confluenced into the great Chesapeake Bay, I swam in those waters, as well as the wide Atlantic Ocean at Virginia Beach. More jellyfish were in the saltier York River than the James, so we swam more in the James. Our neighborhood had a chlorine pool, and I was immersed in that water most of the summer. A creek ran behind it, and the backwash pool water flowed into that creek, surrounded by giant poplar trees and southern yellow pine. The cicadas arrived in summer with a constant drone, reminding us that the heat of Virginia summer had a sounding tone. Honeysuckle, sassafras, and mint were familiar tastes and I learned by age nine to avoid poison ivy. I hadn't figured that out at eight when I convinced my friend to grab random green leaves and rub them all over our arms, thinking we'd get out of school for having a bad rash. We both did get poison ivy, but we were sent to school covered in calamine lotion. I can still smell that pink, powdery scent that didn't actually make the itch go away. There were always crows and cardinals, blue jays and robins. Gray squirrels loved the feeder that my dad installed in front of the dining room window. All the crumbs and toast scraps made it to that feeder. It's a wonder that rats didn't arrive, but maybe the big black snakes kept them away. 
We generally find one or two living around the house. Many, many generations of the same family living alongside ours. I was raised by daffodils abundance and clover, daylilies and ivy, azalea and holly trees, pokey leaves and bright red berries, magnolia's grand blossoms and glossy deep green leaves, redbud and dogwood, irises and boxwood, an oak elder who remains constantly showing us the beauty and depth of staying put and widening through so many hurricanes. Mosquitoes and lightning bugs, horseflies and yellow jackets, and the warm buzzing of honeybees. Inside, we lived with tiny red ants and shared our food, though it was unwillingly. Mice lived in the basement, and whatever resident cat was tasked with keeping them at bay. Silverfish and earwigs lived in the corners and edges of our inside space. Tree frogs and lightning bugs, deer, possum, a run of homestead chickens and too many roosters, pine needles, clay soil, cut grass, and so, so many lawns, the neater, the richer. I was raised by the slow climb of capitalism, the neat equation of strip malls and franchise businesses filling up the once remote peninsula from the city of Virginia Beach to Richmond, taking over farmland and fields and forests. I was raised by an idealism prescribed by worshiping colonialism in the shrine of colonial Williamsburg, where slavery was neatened and quieted. I was raised by an integrated school system that did nothing to dismantle racism, only integrated in name. I was raised by the 70s and 80s in the United States, where accumulation of money would solve all the problems. I was raised by parents who did not say I love you to each other, not until they had less than a decade left. It's a worthy exercise asking who and what raised you as there's so much more than just your parents and your schooling, though of course that is important to consider. All those familiar smells, the attics, the libraries, the wet wool sweaters, those raised you too, and they stay with you everywhere you go. The smells, the sounds, the familiarity of the insects that you grew up with, all of those things make us who we are. You know me, and you know that I like to check in with the astrologers around the moon times and just see how, what are they saying? So this is a quote from Chani Nicholas. She's a really easy astrologer to find online. Powerful, complex, volatile is how we describe the astrology of this second half of July. So if you're an astrology person, go find your astrologers and figure out what this means for you. She did mention that it might be nice for you to take a little time at the beginning of this week if you happen to be listening on Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday. See if you can make some opening for yourself and give yourself a little bit of space to process the shifts that we are going through with this new moon. The new moon is in Cancer, which the moon loves. This is um, comfortable and yummy for the moon to be in Cancer. But this new moon is also in opposition to Pluto. And a lot of times with new moons, it's a good time to start something. And that isn't that we shouldn't be starting something now with this moon, but just be aware that it is in opposition to Pluto, which means that what we begin will have a theme of intensity. Uh, it will be transformative and possibly challenging some dynamics that are already at play. Now, if you have a little bit of revolutionary spirit or radical uh, transformative sense of things, as I do, that sounds like, yep, 
that sounds about right. Everything that I'm putting my attention towards, sending my creativity towards, is having to do with the formation of a future that feels more just. And so maybe all of this is good, but it's also something to pay attention to that we are powerful beings and what we think and do and how we act actually really matters. And a question that I keep bumping up against is how do you navigate your own liberation? What if it's up to us? You know, I grew up in a time where I was raised in an authoritarian household. I went to an authoritarian style public school where you got punished. I, I'm trying to remember if we could get hit in school. You know, that was that became a question at some point, whether it was okay if teachers could spank you, hit you. Corporal punishment was, uh, it seems absurd to me to even imagine that that's a question now. But that was something that I grew up with. Do it the way the whoever is the authority over you. And that could be just the older sibling. But whoever is the the authority has the say. And there's no um, inherent justice. It's just the who ranks highest. And a lot of us know that. But if we're in the middle of deconstructing that for ourselves, how do you navigate your liberation? How do you resolve that sense of relying on the authority? What did we give up in terms of our own freedom to fit into that system of authority? And when we recover our own inner authority, what do we have to let go of in the ways that we expected or hoped to be supported by an authoritarian system? You know, if I follow your rules, then you will have some benevolence towards me, or I could I could be guaranteed that if I followed the rules of the family, I would be fed and housed and loved and cared for. And that's why I didn't go against those things, mostly. So the question becomes, how do you understand your own power, which is your own authority, and how do you use your creative force to engage in your own liberation? I'm saying it as if it's you. I mean, how do I do this? How do I use my creative force? Because I'm convinced that that's my superpower to engage in life with myself being free and listening to my own authority and also paying attention to the things that, that do work for me, the ways that I've been conditioned that actually work and that I want to keep using as I go forward. So how do my daily choices engage my creativity in order for me to express my presence, my, my occupation, and how does that inform this liberation of which I am so interested, of which I speak? And I'm asking myself, and of course I'm asking you too, dear listener, when I don't engage with my personal expression, when I contain or suppress that, who or what am I protecting? And with the light of clarity, when I really bring my inquiry to this, do I agree with that decision? I know I feel like I talk about this a lot. Clearly, I'm trying to integrate this idea so it becomes more natural for me. I think that this is really an important question to form and let it make sense of our future. And that is, when I suppress my self-expression, as it comes through me in the form of creativity, like really simple stuff, when I choose not to wear the brightly colored clothing because I might stand out or draw extra attention to myself, or if I don't sing out loud because I might be embarrassed or be seen as silly, who or what am I voting for in that moment by repressing the creative urges. Is it propriety? Is it cultural unspoken standards or maybe sometimes spoken standards? Who might I offend and why does that matter? What am I upsetting when I live my life out loud? Who am I upsetting? What am I upsetting? And that's just something to 
ponder over, really. I have been noticing how I'm still affected by my paternal grandmother's judgments. She was an imposing woman and insisted on certain manners and ways of being polite that she felt could, um, what do you call it, improve our station. Very British. You know, it was all about fitting in well with the patriarchy. But I didn't question that as a young person. I just learned to do these things. She's been dead for 20 years, and now it's my duty to myself to question why I make some of those same decisions and if they continue to serve my deeper values and my drive towards participating in a more just world. I think this is a time to consider the value system that resides in our hearts. I was listening to an interview with an early childhood educator, and she was talking about how two-year-olds have this inherent altruism and that they're incredibly willing to help other people, other adults, other children, other animals, despite the various obstacles that might get in their way. And if you've been with two-year-olds, I can attest for myself, they really do want to help with everything. And it's really us, the adults, socializing them that shows them how their help isn't wanted after all. You know, it's not actually easy to accept the help from a two-year-old when you're trying to quick get dinner on the table and they want to help you make it. Or it's hard to creatively find the ways they can help you without creating more work, more cleanup. You have to slow way down. It's a whole nother mentality. But that spirit is in us, that desire to help, that urge toward kindness to others. And sometimes that can get socialized out of us. So I'm asking us to question the ways in which we've been socialized. And just that inquiry, that consciousness about why we do certain things and if we want to continue doing them. Of course, some of the things we do want to continue doing, but some of the things aren't serving our freedom and our liberation. And that's just a huge, big, important task to look at in the large process of self-inquiry. So let's get to the hexagram. And I say hexagram singularly because sadly we got a single hexagram, an unmoving, unchanging hexagram, which sometimes is challenging for me. I get a little, I get excited for lots of information. And then when you're stuck with the unchanging hexagram, it calls for more meditation. So, hey, universe. Hey, God, divine, goddess, great unknown, what can we know about this next moon cycle? And what can we focus on to guide us now? And the hexagram we got was 29, danger. Repeating pit, chasm. Ghost River. Collect your forces, confront your fears, take the plunge. Practice, repeat, rehearse, rise to the challenge. The earth pit and the ghost world, danger, an axis of change. Pit or chasm is the sacrificial pit at the earth altar and the underworld waters that flow through it. So the hexagram itself actually is water over water. So imagine you're getting to the heart of water, the flow, what it does, how it moves, has a constant desire for movement. Its symbols are rushing water, holes, pits and snares, tombs and graves, prisons and the yellow springs the deep center where the dead live. It evokes the north, midnight, winter, and cold, dark waters. 
In action, it represents a critical moment that requires courage and determination in face of great fear engendered by the presence of the ghost world. It confronts and dissolves obstacles, venturing, falling, and moving on. So that doesn't, I mean, that sounds a little ominous, doesn't, doesn't it? But I'm going to get to where it has a meaning for me. But I'm going to read a little bit more. In the body, Pitt works through the kidneys, conserving life and pushing the organism to actualize potential. And just note that your adrenal glands sit right there with your kidneys. It is the site of essence or individual fate and transforms the essence into available energy. That's why I'm thinking adrenals. It controls the flow of emotions, particularly courage and fear. Things cannot be permanently in an overweighted state. Hence, there follows the hexagram of the abysmal, which is water, which is the pit, which is what we're talking about, danger, the abysmal. And if you think about that, water flowing, water flowing, we're getting to the essence of the quality of movement that's inside us, which excites me because I think of that, again, as second chakra movement, flow, passion, desire, creativity. It is in us. And of course, that sometimes we get drowned in that place, we get blocked, we get frustrated and stuck. But that flow is there. The initiating force in there still is with us. And that is the thing that gives us hope. This hexagram is explained in two ways. First, man finds himself, human finds himself, woman finds herself, person finds themselves in danger, like water in the depths of an abyss. The water shows them how to behave. It flows on without piling up anywhere. And even in dangerous places, it does not lose its dependable character. Isn't that beautiful? So the water can flow into an abysmal chasm, a never-ending repeating chasm. And the water itself doesn't change its property. It just flows through that. In this way, the danger is overcome. The trigram further means the heart. So the center of the hexagram means the heart. In the heart, the divine nature is locked within the natural inclinations and tendencies, and thus is in danger of being engulfed by desires and passions. Here, likewise, the way to overcome danger is, is to hold firmly to one's innate disposition to good. One's innate disposition to good, like the two-year-old, the altruism that it, it, it arises in us like we're just these beautiful little hopeful seeds. Danger serves as a protective measure for heaven, earth, and the prince. Who, who the fuck is the prince? But it is never an end in itself. Sorry, I don't know who the prince is. Heaven, earth, and the prince? Is the prince the thing between heaven and earth? I'm sorry for cussing. Therefore it is said, the effects of the time of danger are great. I want to read this. This time of danger, chasm, repeating chasms, water, can be especially good for inner development. By holding to fixed and virtuous ethics, by maintaining your inner vision and ideals, all things will fall into a steady, tangible perspective. You will know your relationships to your environment. And in this way, you can accomplish your aims. Although subjective, this perspective is now in accord with the problems facing you. Additionally, by persevering in high-minded conduct, for me, the high-minded conduct is the inquiry, is the questioning, how am I serving my own liberation? You become a living example to your family and your fellow human. Through the consistency of your actions, you guide and inspire others in the handling of their own affairs. This in turn will create order and dispel danger within your milieu. That word we don't hear very often. Thus, you are protected. That's, that always makes me feel good. You know, I'm always looking for that. Am I safe? Am I safe? 
So yes, we are safe. Beyond making you inwardly strong, familiarity with danger, like the near brush of death, can instill in you a profound awareness of the life force and the mysterious nature of the cosmos. Such heightened awareness can bring new meaning, determination, and richness into your life. In its static form, danger is repeated dramatically in regard to your inquiry. Like, maybe I'm just thinking about that, like right now and all this water, and it's just dramatic at this point. The floods in Vermont, dramatic. Your desires lead you into danger again and again. And right, so that passion, that second chakra, it will lead you to water flowing again and again. Repeatedly, you manage an escape only to be confronted with another dangerous situation. And that's the repeating chasms. The water will go wherever there's space for it to go. And maybe our job is to create the vessel to contain it for just a moment. Like imagine putting your cup under a waterfall. You are not containing the water forever. It's constantly flowing through but you're creating the space to contain that, that energy, that flow, that passion, that drive. Such virtuous conduct by strengthening your character may help you transcend the entire affair. <laughs> that just sounds like really old language. The questions that we can ask around this hexagram are, what are you sure of in your heart when nothing else is sure? How can you flow on and on through the dark. There are pits where you fall into the deep dark waters, flowing on into the swirling, unknowable dark. The chasms repeat. There's no detour that would take you around them, so you must practice and learn the way of these deep places. First, there must be truth and confidence, truth to the present moment, because this is simply how it is, and trust in your inner knowing so you can be unreservedly present with an unshakable grasp on the essential core. In these deep waters, there's nothing solid out there to hold on to, no external security, no way to orient yourself, and so you hold fast to your heart. This is a way to create success, staying in communication with creative source, even in the chasm. In movement, you find a different kind of security, one that depends on your heart, courage, and commitment. This is the truest test of your convictions, and you have no way of knowing where your leaps of faith might land. Sitting in the bottom of the chasm does not bring honor. Action does. Also, it's a way to be sure of yourself as an individual after everything else has fallen away. You act, and you become skilled in flowing through the steep-sided chasms. I'm just going to say that if we can really get into the essence of what it is to have flow moving through us, so symbolic water moving through us, that if we don't see the water for its character and we see it as more of an attack on us, oh, it never ends. You know, that feeling of being overwhelmed by your own creative urges that if we can see that as part of our nature and something that we will always be flowing around, containing this way and that, but that we don't have to capture. Because if we capture and encapsulate the water, the water isn't able to express its natural quality of moving and flowing. Does that even make sense? It's making sense to me. So I'm going to send you a telepathic, sensible block of meaning right now. And it's just sort of raining down on you. So I don't have to use words. That's hard sometimes to get it all through in the words. This time I also felt like I needed to ask a little guidance from the Animal Spirit Guidebook. This is the Kim Cran's Wild Unknown. And I spent a lot of time shuffling those cards and out popped starfish. It didn't really pop out. It was the one that I selected. 
Starfish is beautiful, alluring, superficial, or shallow. The starfish is a natural and exquisite beauty, mesmerizing to all. Being around someone with starfish energy is a thrill, like you've been put under a spell of divinity itself. The problem is, these creatures have been reliant on how they look and what other people think of them, and that's important to me, and what other people think of them. That's our socialization that I'm calling into question. So they've been relying on this for so long that they may have forgotten their deeper callings. When this card appears, it's important to ask, am I being swayed by outward appearances? What dreams have I put aside to please others? So I have to ask the question, what dreams did I put aside to please my grandmother? And what dreams did she put aside to please her sense of order and safety and validation and approval? And is that, do I want to keep towing that line? And if I don't want to tow that line, how am I going to receive those things? Because it is necessary. Gosh, I talked about this a long time ago. Cornell West said, humanity has a desire for protection, association, and recognition. And the question is, the philosophical question to ask is, what forms will those take in my life? How will I receive my protection? How will I receive my association? And how will I receive my recognition? Because I'm going to seek it out but I can steer myself in the direction that gives me the effect that I'm looking for, that draws me closer to the kind of world that I want as I receive an answer to those desires for protection, the desire for association, and the desire for recognition. Of course, that's part of the reason I'm doing this podcast, to try and receive those needs that are in me. And and with that, I think we've reached the end We are complete for this new moon cycle. As always, I so appreciate your time that you take with me to sit with me or walk with me or drive with me and listen to these words and and think these thoughts with me. I love hearing from you, so don't be shy to reach out. And if you want to support me, I'm completely open to that. I love how I've got I've received support in so many different ways from so many different ones of you. The easy way that I can mention here is to join me on Patreon. That's patreon.com slash watermoon studios. And I look forward to hearing how this lands for you. I'll be back next time with the full moon. And between now and then, I'm curious to see what what happens? What is this big second part of July astrology have in store for us? Be well, take your time, enjoy whatever you can, and I'll see you soon. The Untuned Tambora bids you farewell. <laughs>